Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to come to this house and to hear your word preached. Father, we just pray that there's a new fear of new laws. Jesus is their Savior. This would be the day that they would give up and give their lives to you. Father, we thank you so much for Brother Jimmy, for the leadership he provides in this church. Father, we just pray that you bless him with help so he can continue. Forgive us our sins and save us last in heaven. In Christ's name, amen. Pastor, appreciate you today. I understand the church has a program planned for this morning. And Brother Albert Reed's going to take uh, charge now and go over the program with us. The church set aside this time to celebrate uh, Pastor Appreciation. Uh, the, the pastor and his wife gave some songs that they enjoy hearing. Uh, the first group will be the men. If they'll come up uh, with the blue book, it'll be page 147. Uh, Brother Melvin, you'll play the piano, and Vera play the organ. Thank you. 
sing another congregational song. Victory was won at Calvary, page 233. Willie, if you'll lay Chloe the piano. And Jennifer, will you come back to the organ?
we're going to sing the unseen hand.
people have another congregational song, Kim, if you'll stay at the end. Uh, Russell, if you'll come uh, lead the song here to the organ. It's what a day that will be, page 476.
church has been blessed with a lot of talent. We try to use everyone. If we let somebody out, we apologize for that. We appreciate Brother Jimmy and Sister Faith for their dedication to the church. We all need to appreciate them more, not just one time a year. I, I would encourage everybody here to give them a special thanks today. I know that we're going to have a lunch after church, but uh, make sure you tell them how much they mean to you. It's good to have a pastor that's always there, so anyway, if I stumbled around too much, it's my pleasure to be the speaker. Y'all pray for me that I always do what the Lord would lead. The church has some cards for Brother Jimmy and Sister Faye and a gift card. We, we as a church uh, appreciate what y'all do. Feel free to call on the church anything that y'all need. Dad, if you'll get a song together and then we'll have the last song and take up our offering. Sermonette. He said, well, sermonettes are for Christianettes. 
So, <laughs> I'm going to read some verses of scripture today in the book of Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. But before we do, um, we have given an opportunity for a prayer request this morning. I uh, can't remember Brother Roger Bullard as he undergoes his cancer treatments. Judy and Bobby Quincy, Jerry Bryan, the Dickens babies, John Daschek, one of our ministers from up in Washington County who had been stricken with um, an operable lung cancer. Uh, Sister Myra, she made Gartman, Camilla, uh, passed away last night. Uh, family asked if we remember them, especially Sandra, her sister, who's the only one left in that family. Uh, Sister Dennis Christian is asked to be remembered in prayer. And Brother Gerald Gibbons, one of our ministers from over in Perkinston, Mississippi area, his granddaughter was killed in an automobile accident Friday night. So remember these requests as well as those prayer requests that are in your bulletin. Would anyone else have a prayer request at this time? I also have a special unspoken. One else. And one else. Do you remember uh, Tiffany's grandmother, Joanne? Uh, she's back in the hospital. Uh, had a pretty bad seizure the other day. She's uh, really kind of touch and go. She's not very responsive right now. But uh, had made some slight improvements over the past couple of days. And one else. You have an unspoken request, like to raise your hand. Pray for our services today. Pray for our nation. Pray for the peace of Israel. Most of all, remember those who are lost. And I always desire your prayers. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the <clears throat> opportunity to come and be a part of this service. We thank you for those who planned uh, this special service on Pastor Appreciation Day. Thank you for beautiful songs that uh, we've heard this morning. I pray your blessings upon each one who has gathered today to worship you in your house. Pray not only you bless it. Services here at Snow Road, wherever your true people have gathered together today, that you could be in the midst. Pray, Lord, that you would just hear and answer prayers, so many requests, so many needs. I just pray your special blessings upon each one. Forgive us of our sins. And have mercy on the lost. God and wreck us through this day. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning in verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And if you'll remember that as time went by, God shortened that time uh, to three score and ten by uh, reason of health that uh, one could even live to be eighty years old. So the time span that man lives now is much smaller than it used to be. Uh, remember Methuselah and how long he lived, 969 years, and I don't know of anyone in our day who has lived that long. But uh, nevertheless, there's a time, and we'll get to that in just a moment in the message, there's a time for all things, a time and a purpose for all things. So <clears throat> as I think about what we just read here, I want to ask a question. If you're here today and you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, will you ever have another chance to be saved if you're not saved today? Do you know that you'll have another opportunity to be saved? 
There are not many guarantees in this life that can hold true under certain circumstances. If you, and I believe I mentioned this here, here a while back, that uh, if you look at uh, your homeowner's insurance policy or even your automobile insurance policy, you'll find that uh, in the fine print in those policies, it will tell you that your property or your vehicle is not covered due to riot, war, or civil commotion. You think about these countries that are at war, you think about what's going on in the Ukraine, you think about what's happening uh, over in the Mideast, and that many people have lost their homes, have lost their automobiles, have lost all that they have. And there's no way to recoup that money from the insurance company because it's written into the contract and it's legal. And this is the loophole that the insurance companies have. If they covered everything, they'd go broke. But they cover the major risk. And I know in the insurance world, having been in the insurance business myself years ago, uh, I thought about uh, when I would write a health insurance policy and uh, that uh, we had those policies that were called major medical policies. And there were certain exemptions and there were certain deductibles and it didn't cover everything. And uh, think about a record Wendy Battle had one time, uh, said he got uh, sick, got in the hospital, had surgery and all. He said he had a good insurance policy. He said he covered the Hong Kong flu as long as you caught it from a Siamese cat. <laughs> and uh, so the, the, there are different ways that uh, we're obligated to self-insure. But if you're here today and you're lost, can you self-insure yourself against eternity outside the blood of Jesus Christ? So as we think about the years passing by, and, uh, they seemingly pass by in a hurry. And uh, when you get my age, you, you understand what that's all about. Uh, I used to hear people talk when I was growing up uh, that the older I get, the faster the years pass by. And uh, I thought, well, you know, that's kind of strange to me. I've been waiting to turn 16 for 16 years, and that, uh, you know, that's a long time to me. And uh, I thought about going through school, 12 years in, in school, and that, uh, that seemed like a long time. Now, 12 years, you bet you uh, you've already lived 12 years. But, Senator, can you be certain that you'll even have one more second, much less one more year? So... <coughs> There's a time, as I said a few moments ago, to all things. In Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, Solomon spoke to this, and Solomon was a very wise man. Uh, he did some foolish things when he got older in his life, but uh, he was a very wise man, probably uh, the wisest man in his day. And uh, people came to him from all the world to receive his advice and his counsel about different things because of his great wisdom and uh, that God is the giver of wisdom. To everything there is a season, this is chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal time to break down and a time to build up. He goes on and speaks about many other areas that uh, there's a time for in this life. But there is a time to all things. And if we'll follow God's timeline, then we'll not get out of order. I thought about yesterday. Our local association met fell my lot several years ago to become moderator of our local association and uh, in the order of business of the association uh, there is 
uh, chart in there uh, concerning the order of business. And I try to stay just as follow that just as closely as I possibly can. Sometimes you have to vary a little bit depending on uh, extenuating circumstances, but most of the time I, I try to follow that just as closely as I can. And the only way it can be changed is by a vote of the associational body. That someone can't just come in and say, well, we're, we're just going to turn this whole thing upside down and do it completely different. They'd be completely out of order to do so without a vote of the associational body. But God has a timetable. God has an order for all things. God is an orderly God. And that's why he's taught in his word that, that all things be done decently and in order. And so, even in, in worship service, that uh, there should be order to that service. And maybe not to the extent that we grew the Holy Spirit out of it, because the Holy Spirit needs to lead us in all things that we do. And if we don't follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we're going to miss a blessing. But there's a time for all things. This year probably began, and this year is fast coming to an end. But it just seems like yesterday that it was January 1st. But this year began with great expectations concerning the things that would happen this year for the new year. And what did you expect from this year? No doubt that you desired better than it was last year. And I know that the natural inclination and thought of a parent would be that I hope my children have it better than I have. That's just natural. For parents to feel that way. Because you know what it works. And we live to see a time that uh, many young couples just starting out now, they're, they're having a, a very difficult time getting started in life because of the economy and different factors entering into the equation. And that they can't expect to go out and uh, maybe have as much as their parents had because of that fact in the beginning. So, you know, there are many things that can enter into uh, the issues that we face during any given year, especially this year. Uh, you know, people have lost their jobs. People have lost loved ones and friends. Many different issues that we face. But if you're not saved, do you expect to be saved? This year, we're great procrastinators. We want to wait. We want to put things off. We don't want to do it now. But when it comes to the salvation of the soul, the Bible teaches that today is the day of salvation. If you hear His voice, harden not your heart. While the Holy Spirit is dealing with an individual and convincing them of their sin and their inability to save themselves and for their need of the blood of Christ to wash away their sin so they might be born of the family of God. God's not always going to deal with an individual. There's no promise of tomorrow. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. That's why I say it's dangerous to procrastinate when it comes to salvation. Because none of us know if we'll see tomorrow. I sat back there a while ago while uh, the program was being presented and my mind went back to time when my wife and I became members of this church back in 2007 and then I became pastor in 2010 and I thought about many of the membership of this church who have gone on to be the Lord 
and how I missed each one of those who have gone on to be with the Lord. Why, he said, well, why do you miss each one of those? Because they were brothers and sisters in Christ. They were members of the family of God. They were members of this church. And as such that I had a, a, a kind of kindred tie through Jesus Christ with them. And God's family is the greatest family on earth. And I'm proud to be a member of the family of God. I'm thankful uh, to be a member of the Lord's church. I'm grateful for the opportunity the Lord gave me to trust Jesus as my Savior. But I had to come to the realization that I was not always going to have that opportunity to be saved. That I had to do something and I had to do it then. I couldn't wait. I couldn't put it off. And that Sunday night, <coughs> excuse me, when I called on uh, the name of the Lord and, and repented of my sin and trusted Christ as my Savior, I felt like that I'd never have another opportunity to be saved if I passed it up that night. And that was not the first time the Lord had troubled my heart. But He was merciful and He was long-suffering, not willing that I should perish, but I should come to repentance. And he's the same way with you. But, there comes a time when you'll no longer feel burdened about your sin. In the book of Acts, in the ninth chapter, we read about the conversion of a man named Saul. He was from a place called Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was very dedicated to a cause, and that was the persecution of the church and of Christians. And whatever endeavor that Paul was involved in, he put his whole heart into it before he was saved and after he was saved. So you can just imagine all the people that he probably had, had persecuted and uh, was persecuting at the time of his conversion. At the time of his conversion, he was on his way to persecute even more of God's people and of the church. And that's when God allowed that great light to shine around about him. And it was such a great light that he fell on his face on the ground. It was a blinding light. God had something for him to do. And he had to rise and be led by his hand into the city. The scales, as it were, had formed on his eyes that he could not see. When the man of God came to him and reached out to him, shared with him the scales were removed. <laughs> you can see. Doctors tell us that every person above 50 years of age is going to the belt. It's not a question if, but when. If there's going to develop a film on our eyes. And it's going to grow progressively worse. And that our eyesight will suffer as a result. But it's, it has become a very simple procedure. It can be done in the doctor's office. It's called cataract surgery. I remember the early days of cataract surgery. I have a church member having cataract surgery. That being ten, eight to ten days for, in a hospital bed looking down. And now, as I said, you go into the outpatient surgery department of a clinic and the same day go home. I've had so many people, I haven't had that surgery yet. My 
ophthalmologist is encouraging me to go ahead and do it, but uh, I haven't given him permission yet because I can still halfway see. But, uh, you know, you, you think about the before and the after. And you see pictures of before and after. And people who uh, do house remodeling, they'll show you a picture of an old dilapidated house just about to fall down. This, they'll say this is before and they'll show you this beautiful house afterwards and they'll say this is after. Well, so many people have told me that I didn't realize that my sight had become so bad until I had that cataract surgery. I can see things now that I've been missing. I can see the brilliant colors now that have become faded. It made a difference. Well, Satan has put a spiritual cataract on your heart, sinner, and only the Lord can remove it. So it's about to see clearly. He has blinded the minds of those that are lost. Why? Lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine forth unto them. So Saul came to the Lord and became a great apostle. 23rd chapter of the book of Luke, and I'm not going to turn over there and read it. I'm going to keep you a whole long time this morning. But we read about a thief on one side who's being crucified on one side of Jesus. Who saw something in Jesus that he'd never seen in anyone else. This morning, Senator, can you see something in Jesus that you've never seen in anyone else? And he saw his need for Christ. You know what? That was his last opportunity. He was in the process of dying on the cross. He'd been crucified. Crucifixion was one of the most cruel forms of capital punishment known to man. In that it was a slow and agonizing death. It normally took from three to five days for someone to die from being crucified. Jesus died the same day. So, would this thief have another opportunity to be saved? No. This was it. This was the last. Because he'd never be, when, when he was taken off that cross, he'd be a dead man. And they go bury him. So he wouldn't come off the cross alive. Jesus did not even come off the cross alive. So he turned to Jesus and he said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You say, well, he didn't say the right words. You know these folks that say, repeat after me? How do they know that's the right words? Based upon the scripture. God knows the heart. He knows what we're trying to say to him, whether we can put it in the words that uh, we desire to put it in or not. Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Freedom, you don't have to wait any longer. You'll go today. Sir, you don't have to wait any longer to be saved. You can be saved today. He said, well, what did it cost that thief, that, that malefactor on the cross? 
this cost him his pride, swallow his pride, and admit his need of the Lord. Sometimes we can be so proud that it's dangerous. We have to let go of that pride and let God work. In verse 3, our scripture reading this morning, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Sinner, he's not always going to strive with you. And I hear people say, Oh, you can be saved anytime you want to. I beg your pardon, not according to the scripture. The Holy Spirit has to bring conviction to the heart before you can be saved. You know, brother, then you can decide you want to uh, eat some rice and milk, and you can go to the refrigerator and you can get it out, and you can eat it. But then you like rice. That's kind of a private joke between us. But anyway, he can do it any time he wants to, as long as Sister Bell's got it in there. But you know, <clears throat> if she put a big old chain and lock around that padlock around that refrigerator, Said, Dean, your day of getting in the refrigerator is over. It's done. No more. He'd be in bad shape, wouldn't he? One day, the Lord's going to close the door to salvation to you, sir. He's going to say, I've dealt with them enough. And it's not because that he's impatient. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there are millions of others out there who need to be saved too. You're not the only one. But he gave his son that you could be saved. And your name can be written in glory you'll trust Jesus as your Savior. Because, again, His Spirit shall not always strive with man. There's going to come a time when the door of opportunity to be saved will be closed. I've known some individuals in this life that apparently that door had been closed. One man made a statement, I know I'm going to burn in hell because I didn't trust Christ as my Savior. If you have no remorse about it, it didn't seem to be sad. Matter of fact, I know I'm going to burn in hell. We see that spirit of conviction had departed. Don't let that happen to you. Don't get to the place that your heart becomes hardened through the sickness of sin and you can't be saved. You say, well, the Bible teaches for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He certainly does. But the Lord does invite him. We come on God's timetable. Not on ours. And God is certainly just in doing so. <coughs> My dear grandmother, bless her heart, was a wonderful cook. And she had her meals at certain times. And if you wanted to eat, you better have your feet on that table by a certain time. Eat all you want. Get seconds. However much you want to eat, you eat as much as you want. And enjoy. But don't you come back in here an hour later and say, I want something else. You're not going to get it till next meal time. That's that her room. She 
be just as sweet as she can be but that turned around and all we grandchildren abided by that fruit because we knew we, we'd get in trouble now she, she'd keep little things in the refrigerator so she'd buy a watermelon cut it up put it in a jar in the refrigerator different little snacks and all we could have that but we couldn't go to the table you know back then people left most of their food on the table their big meal was dinner and they leave most of the food on the table and put a big old tablecloth over it you better not go raise that tablecloth try to get some of that food out between meals you were in trouble you can go to the refrigerator but not the table when God puts that big old tablecloth over the salvation of your soul and you haven't been saved you can't come back later now is the time now is the day for salvation think about it. not just today but in the future I heard a good devotion yesterday at the association about making decisions and making choices. And how important it is to make the right choices and make the right decisions. A person can make a bad decision and it will not only affect them but it will affect those who follow them in generations to come. And I've heard more than one person say down through the years, I wish I had done this differently because it's led to problems in my family because I made some wrong choices. I made some bad decisions. I've had grown men stand in my presence with the tears running down their cheeks and say, when I was a young man, I didn't go to church. I didn't see the necessity of it. When I was a young father, I didn't carry my children to church. And later on, I got convicted in my heart that I need to be faithful to the Lord. He said, my own children told me when I would encourage them to go to church after they'd gotten on up wrong. Daddy, you didn't take us to church when we were little. We just don't see the need to go. You see, the decisions and choices that Daddy made were bad. They affected the children and the grandchildren and great friends and right on down the line. No adage, the family that prays together stays together. There's a lot of truth to that. That family who worships God together, there's a bond there that <clears throat> binds them to the Lord. I'm thankful that I was taken to church when I was a child. I was not just taken and dropped off But my parents were with me in that service. And it instilled in me, first of all, the importance to trust Christ as my Savior. Secondly, the importance of being faithful to the Lord. So you see, Senator, the choices that you make are very, very important. If you make the correct choice to trust Jesus as your Savior, you'll never regret it. If you reject Him, one day when you have children and families, and you haven't gotten your relationship with the Lord right, 
it's going to be difficult for them to do so because they won't see the need to do so. But the main consideration is, where am I going when I leave here? You say, well, I'm going to the house. I'm not talking about when you leave this church building. I'm talking about when you leave this world. Where are you going? Death can come so quickly. <clears throat> Unexpectedly. Death is no respecter of age. The young guy as well as the old. I'm talking about Brother Gerald Gibbons' granddaughter being killed in an automobile accident Friday night. I'm sure when she got on the wheel of that car and went out, she didn't know she'd never go home to her earthly home. Her family didn't know she never come home alive. The Lord did. While you are alive, your heart is beating, the blood is pumping throughout your arteries and veins, your organs are working properly, and the Lord's giving you a brain heart, use it. For with a heart man believeth unto righteousness, with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, not the physical pump that pumps the blood, but that inward being, that innermost being of man. My spirit shall not always strive with man. Is he striving with you today? If he is, let him have his way. We're going to ask for a verse of the invitation to him as we sing this song. Lord, <clears throat> dealing with you, you trust Christ as your Savior. You trust him today. If you're here and you're a member of the church of black faith and you feel led to become a member of this church, a letter, a statement, whatever your name would be.